This program is funded in part by Nora Beverages, maker of Naya Spring Water, a proud supporter of intelligent and informative programming on public television. The H. Van Emmeringen Foundation, and In the Life members nationwide. 25 years after Stonewall, Gay Liberation celebrates its silver anniversary. Let the gay games begin. Not airheads, aria heads. Gay men's long-term love affair with opera. The Red Hot Organization, turning cutting-edge rock into AIDS relief. All this and more on this month's In the... Hey. Welcome again to In the Life, the only national gay and lesbian series you'll find on public television. I'm Greg Watt. And I'm Catherine Linton. Imagine being in a bar, dancing or just drinking with your lover, and suddenly there's a raid, arrests, and you find yourself in jail. All of this simply for being gay. Well, not long ago, in fact just 25 years, this was common practice, even in a city as cosmopolitan as New York. But in the early summer of 1969, patrons of a Greenwich Village gay bar called the Stonewall Inn said, enough. For the first time, they fought back in three nights of violent protest, and the modern gay liberation movement was born. In one moment, gays and lesbians found a new voice. And now we prepare to celebrate the 25 years of struggle and accomplishment since then. So get ready for well over a million lesbians, gays, and their friends converging on New York City in late June for an international celebration of pride and protest, as Chris Montgomery reports. Picture this, the United Nations, backdrop to the largest human rights march in U.S. history. That's what's going to happen here on June 26, 1994. And on that day, picture this, another flag flying proudly beside this great line of colorful national symbols, and this one the most colorful of all, the gay rainbow. Looking at where we've come from the last 25 years, we're hoping to use Stonewall 25 to set the stage for the next 25 years, to show that a street riot in 69 has now become a global action for 1994. This is Belvedere Castle, a fairy tale setting in more ways than one. Come June, more than a million gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and their friends will rally down there on Central Park's Great Lawn, making it, in my opinion, truly worthy of its name. They are speakers of every color and religious and political persuasion from all around the world will gather together to celebrate our past and the commitment to a brighter future. The Stonewall 25 rally is planned to be a seven hour plus extravaganza with uplifting music, international speakers, and a fantastic fireworks finale. It's going to be something bigger than I think this community has seen before. It is going to be a pulling together of all of our communities to really focus on the human rights of lesbian and gay people and how those human rights of whether we're gay or lesbian, bisexual or transgendered are being treated around the globe. We're here in the offices of the Gay Games, a major part of the Stonewall 25 festivities. Running from June 18 through 25, the Gay Games are an enormous undertaking, and one which organizers hope will take gay visibility to a new level. The Gay Games are really about gay pride and also gay visibility, and obviously those are two very important things. Anytime we can get positive role models out there about our community and also get more people involved and find out some of the great things that our community is doing. I think that's great. great. I think another important aspect of the games too is the inclusive nature. I mean, they're, unlike other major sporting events, there's no qualifying times. Anyone can enter. We have more uh, HIV positive athletes than any other sporting event. We have world-class athletes. We have people who have never participated in the event before trying it for the first time. So we'll have some people who have world records and we'll also have uh, 
other people that finish for the first time. But the goal of the Gay Games is to do one's personal best. We're going to have uh, 31 events in over 40 venues. Uh, for the first time ever, same-sex pairs figure skating. Uh, we're also going to have uh, everything traditional, swimming, diving, track and field, um, and some of the newer sports, sport climbing, inline skating, uh, and it's going to be great. Along with planning the largest sporting event ever, Gay Games is planning the biggest gay and lesbian cultural festival as well. Remember. Well, there are two tracks in the cultural festival. There is the premiere track of artists, which will feature performers like Sir Ian McKellen doing a one-man show. Then there is what we call the community track, which will feature artists and performers from throughout the world. On a personal level, why did you become involved? Um, I really felt that with gay games dovetailing into Stonewall 25 celebration, that it was a unique opportunity to reshape how mainstream America and how the lesbian and gay community sees itself. Well, one thing's for sure, we do know how to throw a party, even for millions. And that'll take a lot of dip. Needless to say, we'll be staying on top of this story right through the march and rally. We'll be looking forward to those updates. Next, mapping out new territory. Here's Jerry Snee with the National Climate Report. Jerry? Hi, I'm Jerry Snee, and here's a look at the national climate for gays and lesbians. As clouds dissipate, warm, sunny skies are being reported in some parts of the country, but other areas are seeing major cold fronts building. The entire Northwest, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, is about to be blanketed by storms originating out of the Maybon region of Oregon. In Colorado, the sun has come out as a high-pressure system from Judge's Peak clears blizzard conditions there, but long-term forecasters predict a renewed strength in the chilly winds blowing in from the right. So bundle up and keep active to prevent frostbite. Even in traditionally sunny areas like California and Arizona, there's some cloud seeding going on. So watch out for unexpected flash floods in these areas. Meanwhile, in the east, tornadoes rip through Cincinnati, Ohio, and Lewiston, Maine, uprooting shelters and leaving thousands unprotected from the brutal elements. Following these events, the National Gay Weather Service has issued an advisory that similar high pressures are now forming in Kentucky and Missouri. Residents there should mobilize and stay tuned for local bulletins. Finally, in the Deep South, drought conditions persist, so pack extra supplies if you plan on going camping. Long-term forecasts for the New York area look good in June. Leave those umbrellas at home. It ain't gonna rain on our parade. So that's the National Climate Report. For those of you in particularly rough regions, we're working on a new segment for you. How to convert your closet into a storm shelter. <laughs> That's it for now. Back to you, Greg and Catherine. And now on to sunnier matters. For those of you who think Rigoletto is something that should be served with a meat sauce, we have some news for you. Actually, Rigoletto is part of a steady diet for millions of gay men, as is La Boheme, Madame Butterfly, and a host of other great operas. What's behind the gay man's seemingly insatiable appetite for opera? Here's Alan Tulin to tell us. In 19th century London, fashionable male opera goers would leave their seats and congregate down by the orchestra pit. This became known as Fops Alley. Today, the same kind of thing goes on at all of the world's great opera houses, like right here at Lincoln Center's Metropolitan Opera. But we no longer call them Fops. Now they're known as Opera Queens. I think it's genuinely a phenomenon. All you have to do is go to an opera and cruise, or just look around, open your eyes, um, and you see not only gays and lesbians there, but the whole um, experience that we think of as the operatic, whether or not it's in the opera house or outside, is very gay-inflected. 
Wayne Kirstenbaum is the author of The Queen's Throat. It's a frankly autobiographical consideration of the reasons why so many gay men are attracted to the opera. The whole culture surrounding opera is one of artifice, exaggeration, to a certain extent pomposity. And I think I'm tempted to say that those sorts of outrageousness, flamboyance, and flamboyance make queer people feel at home. And this is a picture of Beverly Sills. Mm -hmm. I was an art director at time at the time of that cover. And when I brought it backstage to Beverly Sills, she was under the impression that she had the only other copy of <laughs> the picture. And I said, no, it's not true. And she signed it for me. Was she amused? Was she happy to sign it? I don't know if she was that amused. <laughs> she, <laughs> she thought she had an exclusive on that one. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. Lenny Levine is a magazine art director who's been going to the opera since the mid-50s. Along the way, he's accumulated mementos of his favorite divas. I see you have another famous singer over here. Is there a story there? Uh, this is my poster of Maria Callas. In 1974, when she was giving concerts in New York, I left the poster at her hotel with a white pen because as you can see the poster is mostly black and I right. wanted her to sign in white uh -huh. but I unfortunately I never got the pen back but you got the poster I got the poster right well that's what and the autograph and the autograph <laughs> yeah Maria Callas is the big gay diva first of all because she's just the big diva and gays want to like what's best and Maria Callas is the best so why not like the best but also she's a mess she's she makes mistakes she presents herself as fractured vulnerable extraordinarily uh, sympathetic person novelist James McCourt sees the fascination of gay men with opera as a manifestation of what he calls the Orestes complex, a reverse Oedipal complex, which involves the desire to marry your father and kill your mother. There's a lot of anxiety about this, this wish to uh, marry daddy and kill mommy. So what they do, what you do is, you um, compensate uh, the defense against that. The defense against that is this manic devotion and um, cult of diva and woman, and you venerate. And I just was very much in love with the sound of her voice, and I associated it with, in a way, my own missed youth. I think I associated in some oblique way the freshness and promise of her voice with the freshness and promise of my own sexuality. There are plenty of opera lovers who aren't gay and plenty of gay people who don't like opera. But still, opera occupies a fascinating place in gay culture. Maybe the final reason is the eternal appeal of opera itself. It allows you finally to connect with experiences that maybe you've had but that you buried and that there's no place in civilized life for you to have those experiences. So Alan, can anyone get in on this? Sure, opera's an equal opportunity obsession. But you know, it's not just about the tragic divas and the high drama, it's really about the music. You see, now that's a problem, because I personally don't know a lot about opera, so where would somebody like myself begin? Well, it's best to start with a more familiar opera, La Boheme or De Fledermaus or Good Bets, or you could just uh, ask the guy at the classical music counter. Chances are, he's an opera queen. <laughs> Probably. Thanks for the tip, Sure. Alan. And now, on to a different kind of drama altogether. Some of the bravest warriors who fought back at Stonewall 25 years ago were the drag queens, a controversial but colorful part of our community. As we're about to see, their roots run deeper than their outrageous hairdos. Because they call it, after all, a drag act, because there are performers and characters who put on makeup and wear costumes, and because there's music, dancing, a stage, an audience, and most importantly, applause. It should come as no surprise that the roots of contemporary drag are planted firmly in theatrical tradition. In ancient Greek and Roman theater, 
in Oriental No and Kabuki plays, and in the comedies and drama popular in Renaissance England, male actors played female characters, and the tradition continues. And if ancient Greece is considered the birthplace of Western theater, Manhattan's Wigstock is the maternity ward of the contemporary drag movement. Now, many of you may not know the story of Wigstock. It turns out that late one night, a few years ago, while Bunny was getting ready for a show, she was sitting there spraying her wig when her joint, I mean cigarette, got too close to the hairspray and set her wig on fire. Lady Bunny was spoken to through that burning wig. It said, if you tease it, style it, and set it, they will come. And come they did. For nine years now, founder Lady Bunny has been hosting Wigstock, an annual festival of drag in Manhattan's Tompkins Square Park. Welcome for the Wigstock Dancers. In the beginning, a handful of people watched two or three drag acts and went home. This year, over 10,000 people gathered for a full day's worth of entertainment. In fact, many people think Wigstock has surpassed Christopher Street's Halloween parade as the multicultural fun event of the year. With cultural phenomenon such as Wigstock, Paris is Burning, The Crying Game, and Kids in the Hall creating such a stir, what accounts for the current popularity of drag? an empowerment. It's a labor of love. Carrying on the rich tradition of our forefathers. We all wore wigs. With cross-dressing crossing over, Wigstock has launched the headliners of today's drag renaissance. RuPaul as Julia? Perhaps some director will hark back to Elizabethan theater tradition when casting Romeo and Juliet. But where, oh where, will they find a seven-foot-tall Romeo? That's some incredibly big hair. I always wondered how much one of those wigs weigh. Well, they're really only about three or four pounds, but what makes them really uncomfortable is you have to seal them on with the glue that goes around your... Never mind. You have something to tell us, Greg? No. All right. Pop music was a little slow in catching on to the AIDS crisis, but the Red Hot organization has been making up for lost time with a series of high-profile theme albums, beginning with the music of Cole Porter, sung by some heavy hitter pop stars. And now they're on to a new project. Here now is Sheridan Bailey. The once notoriously AIDS-phobic rock community has released a new CD called No Alternative. It features the finest of two generations of cutting-edge rockers who realize there's no alternative to getting involved with the fight against AIDS. This program contains explicit information about sex, AIDS, and rock and roll. Repeated viewings may improve your health and social consciousness. Your life may depend upon it. If the pop music world and MTV are becoming more responsive to AIDS in recent years, it's partly thanks to the Red Hot Organization, the world's first pop music record to raise both money and AIDS awareness. But it wasn't a music executive, an artist, or even a gay man who dreamed up the project. Instead, it was John Carlin, 
a lawyer and former art critic who, in 1989, had seen too many friends getting sick. I had always been a very socially conscious person who always wanted to find something to be active about and to, to make a difference in the world, to use a cliché. And I really felt that, that AIDS was something that literally was in my backyard. There were people that I had been to parties with or to openings with you know, three or four months ago that were gone, and I couldn't call them up on the phone, and I couldn't talk to them anymore. One of Carlin's closest friends was David Wanarovich, a visual artist who has since died. But his image and poetry live on as part of Red Hot's newest record, the rock-oriented No Alternative. If I could attach our blood vessels so that we could become each other, I would. If I could attach our blood vessels in order to anchor you to the earth, to this present time, to me, I would. If I could open your body and slip up inside your skin and look out your eyes and forever have my lips fused with yours, I would. It makes me weep to feel the history of you. As the third in what has become a series of records designed for different musical genres, No Alternative targets a younger, rock-oriented audience using bands like The Breeders and Smashing Pumpkins. The video also features short film segments by avant-garde artists like Jenny Livingston and Tamara Davis. We feel like we've got to make great records great music that people would buy. It doesn't have anything to do with the cause. Very few people are going to buy these things because they have to do with AIDS. The other thing that's important, I think, about our approach to doing this is that we hope to reach a broader audience that is traditionally reached through a about AIDS awareness. So we don't want to preach to the converted. We're really trying to reach out to a wider audience. The high point of No Alternative is the collaboration between two of the pop world's most beloved artists. Patti Smith, who sang a song about Robert Maplethorpe, and filmmaker Derek Jarman, whose own battle with AIDS interrupted his work on the first Red Hot album. Little emerald bird wants to fly away If I cup my hand, could I make him stay? Little emerald soul, little emerald eye, little emerald soul, must you say goodbye? So we were really pleased that not, not only that Derek was a little bit better and active and working and still making movies, which is most important, but that uh, we were just so happy that he considered working with us on No Alternative. And what happened was just a beautiful moment where he was a great admirer of Patti Smith and Patti Smith was a great admirer of Derek Jarman and the fact that she wrote a piece about Robert Maplethorpe just sealed the deal and it's this perfect confluence of artistic forces. And we came up with this very, very beautiful film that I think just amplifies the piece and um, ends our show in a, in, a, in a beautiful grace note. Little emerald soul, little emerald eye, little emerald bird, we must say goodbye. And they're an incredible organization. Do they have any other projects in the works? The Red Hot organization plans to release Red Hot and Country, Red Hot and Jazz, and other projects over the next few months. By the way, the entire organization is run by just two dynamic people, proving that each one or two of us can make a difference. And speaking of someone who makes a difference, time now for commentary with Chris Ann Eastwood. This month, she asks that age-old question, how gay are you? I'm often asked, how long have you been gay? Or when did you first know you were gay? Or can you tell me who's really gay in Hollywood? But I'm never asked, how gay are you? I guess that's like, how pregnant are you? Well, I'll tell you, I'm as gay as the day is long. Everything I do is gay. Everything. I can't tell you how difficult it is to be that gay, which is why I have my gay agenda, to keep track of all the things I need to do to be totally gay. Like, I've got to buy gay clothes. I have to read <coughs> gay publications. I have to listen to gay music. I have to be up on gay politics. 
I have to know my gay leaders, and I have to patronize gay businesses. I have to interact with the gay community. I have to give money to gay causes, and I have to go to gay marches. I have to get arrested at gay demonstrations. I have to talk with gay support groups. I have to educate my gay-friendly friends. I have to worship gay icons. I have to know gay poetry. And I have to keep coming out, since you know it's a lifelong process. So if you're gay, I want you to ask yourself, are you gay enough? Are you as gay as you can be? Well, if you are, good for you. But if you're not, take a long nap today and get started tomorrow. So, Greg, how gay are you? Gayer than you. No, you aren't. <laughs> yes, I am. No, you yes, aren't. I am. No, you oh. By the way, Chris Ann doesn't have the last word around here. Or you. You do. And we'd like to hear from you. So call or write us. In the meantime, we'll show you what's coming up next time out. In the... Doing laps. Swim team's ready for competition at the Gay Games. Gay comic Scott Capuro sets the screen on Doubtfire as Harvey Firestein's lover. Gay Gorilla TV, inside the no holes bar world of public access television. And now we're going to get out of here ourselves. So until next time, stay tuned and stay with In The Life. Oh, you've got the love for me so much. Got the skin I love to touch. Got the arms to hold me tight. Got the sweet lips to kiss me goodnight. From this moment on, you This program is funded in part by Nora Beverages, maker of Naya Springwater, a proud supporter of intelligent and informative programming on public television, the H. Van Emmeringen Foundation, and In the Life members nationwide.